Hello and welcome back to the Sekimea Spun Glass. We're currently in that awkward phase where I've already gotten the achievement for finishing chapter 3, but the game says we're still in chapter 3, so I'm guessing we'll start chapter 4 in this episode. Uh, let me just do one quick thing, because there was a comment recently on uh, one of the slightly older videos, not too old, uh, where someone wasn't sure we've done like all the choices, so let me just quickly check through all of it. Um, why is one yellow and one red? Because we've definitely done both of these, so now I'm confused. That was a lot less clear than I thought it would be. Okay, these are both yellow. Huh. And in chapter three, let me just check. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, these are also both. Why are these not both yellow? Because we definitely stayed inside the elevator where we got killed. I remember that. So I don't know. But I'm pretty sure we've done all different paths. So, let's continue. Iron was covered by a vast cape of snow. During the winter, Caliant were the only flowers that had survived the climates, and they encompassed its entire spectrum of flora. A member of a large range, the mountain extended behind Yushibana, its perpetual snowy top reaching higher than the others. Years had passed since it had last been visited. It had long ago been said that only its neighbours were holders of innumerable gemstones. On its base, different species of Caliant peeked through the snow. After so long, however, they were accompanied by something else. Dead bodies. Human footprints, marked on the ground, they wandered about. Far from them, a man walked on the snow. His name was Gunn, and in the distance he could see the mountains he'd often travelled through. It was the first time he'd brought his equipment to Irun. He'd always been curious to know whether the common belief about it being devoid of value was true. And, after hours, he had verified it. He hadn't found any caves, and the surface had been harder to traverse than Irun's neighbours. Disappointed, he walked back before the sun set. He'd been out all day and he was exhausted. I like that OST by the way. He was walking down a narrow path when something caught his eye. He'd already crossed the tree line so tall trees were surrounding him. He stopped himself when he noticed an opening between two of them. Intrigued he walked over to it and as he got closer he realised what it was. An entrance to a vast field of grass enclosed by the trees that hid it from view. However, what truly stood out was further ahead. There was a wooden cabin in the corner of the field, it lay covered in white. Speechless, he was drawn to it. The grass was tall and it had almost been concealed by the snow. Slowly making his way inward, Gunn didn't take his eyes off the cabin. He'd never heard about it and it looked abandoned. Many questions came to him, but they all suddenly vanished. He looked at the ground. On top of the snow, he'd almost missed something that easily blended in. Was it an egg? He crouched by its side and felt its surface. Strangely, no snow was on it. When he touched it, his face was one of amazement. It was very smooth, but it was heavier than it looked. He'd never seen anything like it in his life. What was it, and why was it there? Gunn didn't care, and was eager to bring it home. It looked like a gemstone, but it hadn't been underground. Content to have found something, he kept walking toward the cabin. The door was open, so he took a look inside. A few spiders had set up shop there. Most of them had died out during the winter, but their webs still decorated the room. Gan didn't dare look down into the storeroom. The last thing he wanted was for some large spiders still living down there to be disturbed by him. As he'd expected, it didn't seem like anyone had been there in a long time. The 27th of November was a Sunday. That was why Gan had chosen it to go to Irun. Late into the day, he arrived at home. With one hand, he unlocked his front door. He stepped into his shop, Misashi Gemstones. He left his discovery on a stand and hurried to turn on the heater. Then he grabbed the phone and dialed the number he had memorized. 
Lei, I'm sorry to call you so late. Uh, is this a good time? What do you want? I just found something that will interest you. You have to see it. Is it about a gemstone? It, yes, but it's not a normal one. I found it on Irune, and it's unlike any I've seen. Is that so? If you're not exaggerating, you might be in luck. I'm not. I'm certain this would fit perfectly in the tower. Is it alright if I come tomorrow? I want to speak to you about something. Yes, that's perfectly fine. I'll be there in the afternoon then. Thank you. I'll be waiting. Good night. The call cut off. Gunn pumped his fist in relief. It had been a while since he'd struck a deal with Ashia. He sat on his chair. He was tired. And he had to think about what he'd say the next day. A while later, he raised his head. He'd noticed something. A smell, surely. Yeah. A smell he hadn't perceived before was in his shop. He couldn't discern what it was, but he slowly walked over to the gem he'd brought. Was it the source? He got close to it, but he suddenly retreated. Then, carefully, he placed his hand on it. It was hot. Very hot. Why? It had been cold before. Why had its temperature changed? Concerned, he grabbed it. I mean, it was buried in the snow. Of course, it was cold before. He examined it closely, but there was no explanation for the temperature change. What could have caused that? And, most importantly, would it ward Ashia off from buying it? He stepped out of his shop. Outside, it had remained cold. And soon after he did, the gem cooled down. In the blink of an eye, the warmth around it had faded. Was it the surrounding temperature? No matter what, it hadn't seemed normal. In awe, Gan stepped back in, letting the heat make contact with the gem. Immediately, he noticed the change. The smooth surface began to heat up exponentially. What did he have in his hands exactly? How was such a rapid change in temperature occurring? And would Ashia be against taking such a thing? Gan began to worry. He remembered that a long time ago Ashia had sold him storage cabinets, and one of them had been equipped with temperature regulation. Biting his lip, he went to his storage room. One of the dusty cabinets had a wheel on its side. He dragged it close to an outlet and plugged it in. The temperature in Yushibana was around zero degrees Celsius. Matching it, he rotated the wheel and brought the gemstone there. After leaving it inside, he waited for the temperature to stabilize. And when it had, he touched the gemstone one more time. All warmth was long gone, and the smell had also faded. It was bizarre, but Gan's mind went again to Ashia. What would they say about something so peculiar? Tired, he went to his bedroom. He knew he would fall asleep instantly. He was still in his belt and equipment, jacket, hat and gloves, so he hurried to take them off. The next day, Lei came to visit Gan, who had been preparing what to say. After a warm welcome, she was brought to the Sekimeo. That was the name Gan had chosen for the gemstone. As soon as Lei saw it, she let him know Ashia were interested in buying it. It had taken a lot less convincing than Gan had expected. Lei let him know the reason. Ashia had been searching for a unique gemstone, and the one he'd found would serve that purpose well. Gan and Lei had long ago agreed on a standard starting sum per gemstone, which Gan couldn't pass on. However, he hadn't yet mentioned what he'd found out about the Sikimeo. Yesterday, I noticed the heat's temperature might have damaged it. That's why I've got it cold right now. Oh, it's cold in there. Yes, I advise you to do the same. The lower temperature seemed to immediately alleviate the problem. It's currently set to zero degrees. That's fine. We can do that. Good. Just in case, then. I would suggest you not touch it while it's not kept cold. It's delicate, so I wouldn't risk it. Lei silently nodded. So all of those came from the fact that Gan just told them that. Hmm. Gan took a deep breath. If Asha did what he had instructed, there would be no problem. We'll deal with the paperwork then. You know the usual. We'll be here this Wednesday. Is 9pm a good time? Sorry if it's too late, we're pretty overloaded. Yes, any time is fine. I'm still open at that hour, so I'll have everything prepared. Perfect. Both of them bowed and Lei calmly exited his shop. When Gan woke up, he didn't open the shop. He'd been thinking that something else could have been on that mountain. 
the gemstone he'd found. Why had it been there? Snow had fallen days prior. So why had none been on it? Had someone dropped it there? Someone who knew about that place? Asha paid well, so Gunn hadn't stopped thinking about going back to that grassy field. Was it possible he had missed something? When he spotted the familiar opening between the trees, Gunn deviated from the narrow path. Once more, he saw the short cabin. It was two days later, so his footprints had almost fully disappeared. He scanned the terrain, slowly stepping forward. He noticed something and hurried over to it. A section of white stood out, but it wasn't snow. He approached and slowly reached down. It was another gemstone, identical to the one he'd found. Gan searched through the entire field, but he found nothing else. At home, he called Lei and told her about his latest discovery. When she heard it looked the same, she sounded interested. However, there was an issue. Ashi had already revealed the Sikimea's existence. On that day, the primary announcements had been made. You know what? This might be great. You remember what I told you, don't you? We're keeping the details of the Sikimea a secret, and this could be something perfect to reveal on the day of the event. We'll buy both of them. There were many things Lei hadn't told Gan, but that was the truth. If Sin didn't make their move before the 15th, Asha could justify part of the build-up on the existence of two identical paired gemstones. That is why, until that day, most people who uttered the words of the Sekimea weren't aware they were referring to two gemstones at once. Chapter 4 Caliant. I wonder where the other gemstone was hidden originally. And when I say originally, I mean originally in the tower, while well, one was in the cabinet. In a small town encircled by mountains, a house stood out from the others. It was surrounded by an empty field, and it was often referred to as a mansion. Nobody truly knew the family who lived in it, but the numerous bad rumours about them were known by all. For a long time they had been believed to be secretly authoritarian, however, crimes had recently started to be linked back to them. When the afternoon came, a swarm of students exited the single school in town. It was starting to get cold, so most of them walked home. In the mansion's living room, a 13-year-old boy named Kyuka sat on a large sofa. It was his favourite spot, the most comfortable place in his own world. Idly, just passing the time, he watched whatever was on television by himself. Most days, he would come home from school and do that. In the past, he had sometimes played with friends, but he had distanced himself from them as time went on. Solitude was his preference. The lesson he had taught himself from years of exposure to others was that they weren't worth his time, and so once in a while he wouldn't go to school for the simple reason that it was too much of a bother. His parents were upstairs. He had, over time, picked up on what their business entailed, but the details were neither accessible nor relevant to him. Kyuka heard the door open. When he glanced at it, he saw his older brother stepping in with a girl he'd never seen before. Who's that? She's a friend of mine, I'm just going to show her the house. Without saying a word, she was brought upstairs. Kyuka saw it as none of his concern at all. In his eyes, she was either somebody related to his parents' business, or just another source of entertainment for his brother. When night had come, he hadn't seen anyone else. After making his own food, Kyuka walked to his bedroom. He couldn't easily fall asleep with things being so noisy, so he covered himself with the sheets. I really like the design of those backgrounds as well. The next evening, watching television as usual, he saw a familiar face. The girl had disappeared in the town where he lived. Hugo wasn't remotely surprised. They didn't operate in shadows, there was no need to do so. She was the daughter of someone with strong ties to the town's leadership. That made sense. His brother was just carrying out something that was both productive and fun for him. Hours later, his older brother came down from upstairs. He looked cheerful and left after silently waving to Kyuka. He'd learned the girl's name, Honora. It made no difference. Regardless of her name, she was locked in the same room as always. Soon, he heard plaintive cries coming from above. Kyuka responded by turning up the volume. 
Eventually his brother came back with some bags he hadn't left with. A day had passed with no minute full of silence. In the living room, Kuka tried to ignore the muffled noise. Whenever those situations occurred, he went to school just to get away from it for a while, but he had to come home eventually. He didn't like it. He knew that girl was suffering and he didn't want that. However, he wouldn't talk his brother out of it and he didn't want to annoy him. Furthermore, the room upstairs was always locked and he couldn't bring himself to let anybody know. She hadn't done anything to deserve it, presumably. Few of the people his brother brought home gave him that impression. He didn't think of himself as a bad person and would have helped her if he could, but that was a mere notion. It wasn't realistic enough for him to act on. That was why he'd always stayed aside, quietly sitting on that sofa. But his mind suddenly changed when he saw something he hadn't seen in a long time. It was a key. When his brother had gone up loaded with what he'd bought, he'd left his keys in the keyhole. Yuka silently stood up and walked over. He looked back, confirming his brother wasn't coming. Then he detached one of the keys from the ring and stored it in his pocket. Beyond the wooden ceiling, she continued to yell. On some level, such barbarism disgusted Kuka. He was getting tired of it. Sighing, he lay on his side to muffle the sound entering at least one of his ears. He'd endure it louder and for longer. Part of him really did wish to take action for once, whether it was from the presence of the key or not. It had been ages since he'd had a conversation with his brother, but at some point a part of him had come to revile his sibling. He asked himself a question. Was it worth doing something? Answering that was difficult for Kuka. He didn't like people. They were rude, selfish and just too much effort to deal with. If any of them had cared about him, he might have fought differently. On the other hand, he knew that he'd barely tried to speak to anyone in a long time, and his brother wasn't exactly deserving of anyone's attention, let alone approval. His parents and his brother, his whole family was composed of deplorable individuals. He saw himself as different. It wasn't his choice to hurt people, and he would have actively stopped it if he could. So given the fact that he could, it only made sense to do so. When he thought about it like that, he came to a decision. The next day, Kuka stayed home. As soon as his parents left the house, he went up the stairs. The phone was there. Quietly, he dialed the police's number. When they picked up, he anonymously revealed Honora's whereabouts, claiming to have heard yells coming from the house. Then, before his brother could hear him, he slipped back to his sofa. There was no way out for his brother. He hadn't asked about the missing key, so thanks to that, he knew Honora would be found. Many years earlier, Kuka's parents had added a secret to their house. An entrance or exit nobody would notice. Kuka had seen it being used a handful of times. The rumors about the mansion were known by the whole town. The first time that someone had disappeared, the police had quickly shown up. Yet thanks to that well-hidden exit, Kuka's brother had avoided being caught. Kuka knew that when the police appeared, his brother would try to escape with the girl. However, with the key that he had taken, that would be impossible. Hey, Kuka, what was that? His brother had appeared from upstairs. Internally panicking, Kuka responded. What was what? I heard a noise. Did you want to come see or something? No, what's the TV? Ah, ah, okay. You have some free time though, right? Want to learn the works? Job training? No, I'm tired, so maybe later. You say that every time. Oh well, I'll get back to it. If you don't want to learn the family business, you better go to school more. Keep your grades up. <laughs> he went back upstairs. A few minutes had passed since Kuga had gotten off the phone. He'd accidentally alerted his brother, but that danger was gone. All he had to worry about from that point on was looking like an accomplice. Barely seconds after his brother had gone back to the room, a sharp sound came from it. No more yelling. No more anything. It was silent. A horrible feeling, like being submerged in icy water, overtook Kyuka. His brother had a gun. He knew that. What he didn't know was why he would just shoot the girl. The police were coming, and there was absolutely no chance his brother escaped with anything less than a murder charge. He deserved no less, but for him to kill her so suddenly was unthinkable. He hadn't given that expression at all a few seconds earlier. 
Kyuka stood up and stepped up the stairs, eyeing the door warily. Each of his footsteps was carefully placed to prevent a repeat of being detected. The door wasn't locked. He gingerly nudged it open, not afraid that he'd see something worse than what he had before, but afraid that he might be shot by reflex. The body of Kyuka's brother was on the floor, completely immobile. There was no doubt in his mind that he was dead. Something connected in his mind. His brother hadn't gone up just to shoot her right away. She had shot him. His noise had been the distraction that allowed her to escape confinement and get a weapon. The girl wasn't in the usual chair he used. Around it was an untied rope and bloodstains much older than the one surrounding Kyuka's brother. But Kyuka didn't see her anywhere. The girl had vanished. Bewildered, he stepped into the room. In an instant, she emerged from behind the door and shoved the gun up to his face. The barrel took up almost his entire field of vision. He couldn't think of a thing to say. No longer feeling like he was sinking, felt nothing. Give me one reason not to shoot you two. I called the police. They're on their way right now. What? When? A few minutes ago. Her hand was shaking violently, and beyond the metal barrel, Kyuka could see her face. One of her eyes was missing, and the pain, dulled it as it must have been, was getting to her. Adrenaline couldn't keep her going against exhaustion forever. Why wouldn't you call them earlier? You were here when I got here. He didn't say anything for a few seconds. The wrong response could have killed him. It was clear that she was completely unstable. She had lost so much blood that her actions were slightly sluggish as well. Do you know what he would have done if I'd called the police earlier? What he did to you, but worse. Y you didn't do anything. You let you let him do this. The police will be here in a few minutes. You're safe. I don't believe you. Kyuka considered for a moment. He didn't have a good way to escape. Entering the room blindly had been a mistake for him. He'd believed that even if she was just like everyone else, not worth caring about, it would be a good thing to put a stop to what his brother was doing to people and it could have ended up costing him. All Kyuka had accomplished was getting him killed and putting himself in a dangerous position. There was only one course of action he could take at that moment, and it happened almost automatically. After repeatedly knocking, the police forced the door open. Drawn by the smell of blood and gunpowder, they immediately located the room where two corpses lay. A man and the kidnapped girl were on the floor. Immediately the entire mansion was secured, but nobody else was found. The next day the news was published. Honora, the girl who disappeared, had been found dead high on a mountain. One of her eyes had been gouged out and the other had a bullet through it. A bewildered Kyuka read that article. That day he came back home and realized that his parents were there. As usual, he had no idea what they would say. Before they saw him, his parents looked terribly sad. However, when he appeared, relief spread through them. His parents didn't talk about what had happened. While he found it strange, Kyuka couldn't bring himself to utter a word about it either. Kyuka would be the family's final generation. That was something he was sure of. However, even that was stripped away. On paper, at least. After what had happened with his brother, his last name carried a heavy stigma, and so his parents took action. He was released from that family. Then, he kept secretly living in that mansion, until he was given a new place in the center of the town. If nothing else, he appreciated that his job wasn't nearly as dirty as it could have been, and that he had some peace and quiet. Hmm. Interesting. Now I think the only person we actually know of who has a job in town is Darfri. Or Gan. Technically, now we know Gan as well. I yeah. Well, it don't they only said they changed Kyuka's last name. So I guess he if he is anyone we've already known, then his first name is also something he has kind of just changed himself, taken on a different persona. If we don't know him, and you know that random sentence at the end about him finding a job in town and you know having some peace and quiet, is just you know a nice add-on to the story or something like that. 
and he's maybe not actually relevant. He also technically could be one of the... Uh, how many are there? Eight people? Well, he probably... You, did, did they say, I think he's a guy. I'm not sure if it was outright stated. Um, but yeah, 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 he should be, he should be. Um, so, technically one of four, maybe? Yeah, either way. Um, interesting story. Not sure how it will connect. We'll see. The lights turn on in the tower. The lobby door opened and a man stepped into the hallway. It was Kate, who had recently changed into his working uniform. Ready to begin his morning shift, he entered the security room. His colleague, Ku, was ready to leave. After greeting each other, Kate sat on his chair. Over the phone, he'd learned Sin had attacked again. It had happened on the 24th and it had started during his own shift. On that Thursday, there had been an event in the tower where many gemstones had been replaced. The next night, they had all been taken. Long ago, his job started to exclusively revolve around Sin. Ashi had been outsmarted repeatedly and every measure they assigned was continually bypassed. It was Kate's job to put an end to those incidents. However, his thoughts on Ashi were far from positive. He'd worked in the tower for years and he knew information that eluded public knowledge. He was fully aware that none of his superiors belonged to the Ashia family anymore. It had been long ago when the corporation had lost all ties to their actual bloodline. Hmm. Kate stared at the three monitors in front of him, and as he moved the cursor toward a folder, his heart began to race. Sin had been circumvented. Uh, Sin had circumvented their measures multiple times, but that hadn't been all. Camera footage had been erased, and they'd taken advantage of the rare times when the security room had been empty. Kate knew someone close to them worked for Sin. There was no other explanation anymore. There were many candidates he had considered, but they, they'd all looked clean. As he approached a hidden folder, he wondered again who it was. A few places in the tower weren't fitted with cameras, but trying to catch Sin on video had long ago started to feel like a futile effort. Kate had ruminated on something for quite a while. He wanted to use the places without cameras to catch the infiltrator. Before arriving at the tower, he'd been told that footage of Hawaii A had been erased. That was why he'd been nervous all morning. But he had to be careful. Opening that folder might have been a bad idea. How had Sin erased the footage? It had always happened during times when the security room had been vacant, but Kate thought that was off. Most recently, it had happened when he'd been out, but he didn't think anyone would have had enough time to remove the footage. Could that computer have been infected? Like he'd done in the past, he spent the entire morning cleaning it up as much as he could. And when he was done, he sent the folder to an email address that he had created at home. That evening, he hurried to his personal computer. He'd been wondering all day as if his plan had worked. He hadn't spoken to anyone about it. There was no sin, no way Sin had known about it. Finally, he logged into his account and downloaded the folder. Inside it, there was a long video. The day before Sin's attack, he'd been forced to momentarily rush out of the security room. During that time, part of the footage had been erased. Kate had been waiting for that to happen. That was why when he dashed out of the security room, he hadn't closed his door. Its door. The footage from Hawaii A had been erased, but had Sin accounted for Kate's idea? During that time, another camera had been recording part of the hallway. The computer's webcam tucked behind one of the monitors. It spent most of the time turned off, but that time it had been recording the hallway through the open door. Kate had pressed the button behind the camera to begin the recording, and it wasn't a new device in the tower. There was no way Sin had learned of his plan. Kate played the video, his trembling hand advancing it to the time he'd left the room. That had been the only time of the day when he hadn't monitored hallway A, so Sin must have wanted to hide those few seconds. The time was before 9. When Kate saw his face disappearing from the video, he let go of the mouse. Then he saw all he needed to see. Through hallway A, someone he knew passed by. 
They were pushing a cleaning cart. That was what Sin had wanted to hide. Finally, he knew the identity of the infiltrator. Edo, the janitor. But he still didn't know what had happened. Gemstones had been stolen from one of the rooms, but that hadn't happened until the following night. Yet, when they'd gone through the available footage, nobody had entered that room at the time of the attack. They'd been moved? Kate stared at the cleaning cart, wondering if they'd been inside it. If that was the case, they could have immediately been taken out. However, during the time of the attack, Ido hadn't been in the building. There was something else of value Kate learned. The footage of some cameras had been erased while he was out of the security room. However, as he'd suspected, nobody had entered it before his return. Kate had started working in the tower decades ago, and many years were still ahead of him. He'd worked on the building's security before, the security room had been constructed, but that hadn't always been his job. When he looked at the future, he hated it. He despised the thought of working there for even another year. He had no respect for Ashia, and there was nothing about what the company had become that he identified with. He had seen the building change over the years to the point where it simply didn't feel the same. Since Sin had reared their head in pursuit of Ashia, some concepts had become tempting to Kate. During his night shifts, he was sometimes the only person in the building. He had given plenty of thought to taking out Ashia's collection of gemstones. It should have been simple. It happened before, so he could claim that the security footage had suddenly been erased and that he hadn't seen anything through the monitors. But that was too dangerous. Sin seemed to know everything that happened in that place. What if they exposed Kate as being responsible? Would they dislike being impersonated? He was worried they would threaten him too. And even if none of that happened, Kate didn't know what he'd do with those gems. After everything, Kate didn't think it was fair that he had to keep working there. He couldn't bear the thought of staying in that place for much longer. His parents had died and he wouldn't be able to support himself for too long if he left his job. It wasn't fair. After Sin's first attack, his mind had produced various scenarios that gave him what he wanted. When the morning came, Kate had slept very little. He would wanted to find a Sin member for so long, and he was confident he finally had. However, it was fairly large scale, so he'd been very hesitant to set it into motion. He left his house earlier than usual. On the way, he called Lei. She was the only person he'd always been confident wasn't part of Sin, as she wanted to catch them more than anyone else. Kate, what do you want? I would like to talk to you later. It might not be a good idea to do it in the tower, so if I can meet you outside before my shift starts, that would be great. Is it important? Yes. I understand. I will be there as soon as I can. Thank you. Outside the tower's entrance, Kate and Lei met. Furtively, they stepped aside. What is it? I've had this idea for some time. If we're ever going to do something like this, now is the time. After hearing that, Lei frowned. Meanwhile, Kate thought of the best way to phrase what he'd wanted to say for months. It's evident Sin has a way to be in the tower without being seen, even when we're prepared. I believe we have to stop trying to see them while they're attacking. When we added locks to the cabinets, they were able to unlock them and even broke some of them. It was a while ago, but remember what we thought? We removed those locks to prevent future damage and because that would incite Sin to easily come back, so we'd be able to catch them. We added an alarm to be alerted that cabinets were opened, but it didn't go off when they attacked. At this point, I find it impossible to believe they can't externally access the computer. I've looked into it many times, but that has to be true. Do you think we should change out the computer entirely? No. Access to our computer can't be all they have. If we change it, they'll immediately know they lost that information, which could be bad. I would also not be able to protect a new computer at all times. I have an idea. If I develop the mechanism behind a new alarm at home, it's possible they won't be able to bypass it. I think this is what we should do so that they don't think we're suspicious of anything involving our computer setup. 
Once I set up the software for this at home, I'll bring it to the tower's computer. If I do it well, it's unlikely they'll notice it. I see. I think that's worth doing. Me too, but we have to be smart. If this works, we have to catch them. We can't screw this up. If they really activate the alarm, they might still have a method of escape. We have to make sure that won't be possible. How? I can build it so that when the alarm is activated, any exits will close. As soon as they open a cabinet, they will be stuck in a tower. I have thought a lot about this. They have attacked during times I was in the security room, so we'll make sure one of us is always there. If the mechanism also locks that door, we will trap the attacker. Do you think this could work? It must. They have always attacked during the night, so I'm confident it will go smoothly. For the first time in what seemed like forever, Lei thought that one of Kata's ideas had real promise. How would the exits be locked, though? That's what I can't handle. If I use the old system, I can have the mechanism ready for tomorrow. The installation would have to be done during the night, though, when no one else is here. It will be independent of the computer, so Sin shouldn't learn about it. I believe it's possible they're receiving the camera's feed, but the lobby isn't recorded, so they won't see it. But what about the windows? Wouldn't they be shut as well? You're right, that would be seen. I wouldn't like to disable the camera system because they could learn something is being done. Nothing happens on the higher floors during the night. I can modify the system from home as well to disable those cameras and loop a still image of the floors, then quickly install the modification on the tower's computer. I doubt Sin would look at that footage, but if they do, they shouldn't notice the cameras were stopped. However, we can't do it like the last time. Altering every cabinet to trigger the alarm is something that could easily be noticed and it would take a long time. That's true, but it's what we would have to do. We can draw them to a specific cabinet. Do you remember when we obtained the nom died? It was targeted by Sin immediately. If we procure procure something of that caliber, Sin won't be able to resi resist a repeat. That will be the cabinet we'll need to alter, and since it won't be one currently displayed, we can modify it before they know it exists. Lei nodded thoughtfully. Kate's plan could definitely work. I see. I will try to find a good fit for that. Perfect. We should hurry up before they attack again. If I'm not mistaken, the event for the 15th of next month was hindered. It was going to be a guided tour to cover the last wave of gems, but that can't be done anymore. That's right, it's cancelled as of now. When you find a suitable gemstone, announce it will be shown on that Thursday. The w this way, if Sin doesn't attack beforehand, will still solve that problem. That's a very good idea. I'll do that. Kate nodded slowly. That was what he needed the most. The 15th was a Thursday and also the middle point of the month. That meant that it was the day his work shift would change. In the first half of the month, Kate worked during the night, and in the second half, he worked during the morning. Up until the 15th, he'd been in the tower all night, ready for Sin's attack. However, he'd also learned Sin made daylight moves, so if the attack didn't happen before the 15th, Kate would be present during the event. I will do my best to find something appropriate, then we will put it in a prepared cabinet, and you will enable the system on the tower's computer. Yes. Why don't we do it differently? Why not make it so that opening the cabinet locks the room it's in as opposed to the entire building? No, that could go wrong. Altering those doors is much more likely to be noticed, and if someone inside the room was quick, they could get out before being trapped. Kate's voice was stern. He couldn't waver in initiating the plan. You think so? I was thinking about a mechanical lock, not a shutter. That wouldn't work. They could keep the door open and put a hard object between it and the wall to prevent it from locking. I'm aware my idea is more complex, but we can't risk this. Alright, we'll talk about it further. I will let Ku know about this when he leaves, and I'll speak to Wiz. Is that fine? Kate nodded after a pause. Ku and Wiz were the first people he'd personally investigated as they shared his job. He couldn't be completely certain, but he really didn't think they were part of Sin. 
Kate's shift was about to start, so he bowed and stepped into the tower. As he walked to the security room, he sighed, relieved Lei hadn't put more pressure on him. That would have prevented what he had in mind. It was something only he could do, and it was thanks to a key that had once saved them. It was the 6th of December. Kata had been shut in the security room for a few hours. He was staring at the screens, knowing that Sin's attack could come at any time. Suddenly, an alarm blared. Immediately, he knew they were in the building. But he didn't understand how that could be. Through the monitors, he couldn't see anyone anywhere. Oh, I see. The security system was hacked. It almost worked. Kate smirked. Before the alarm ceased, he found the anomaly in the system. Sin had sabotaged it without being noticed. When Kate fixed the problem, all the screens updated, and through one he saw a man in the event room. He looked disconcerted, desperately glancing around him. Kate moved the microphone close to his mouth and turned it on. When he spoke, his voice played everywhere in the building. We knew you would come. The gemstone in front of you, as well, uh, was all we needed to draw you here. The man looked up, trying to find the source of the audio. Oh, is that the time where Atsushi... Uh, Atsushi? Wait, what's his name? Atsushi? Atsuki? Atsuki. Um, wait, now I'm actually confused. Give me a second. Uh, where would it say his name? How did I forget his name. Atsuki. Yeah, it was Atsuki. That was the time he was back in the tower before uh, the attack in quotations. Unfortunately, you have been trapped. You won't be able to leave this building. When he heard that, the man ran to the lobby. He disappeared from Kate's sight, but he soon reappeared, dashing toward the staircase. It's futile. The way to the second floor is locked, and the elevator has been disabled. The man ignored Kate's voice and took out a key. Oh, Sin even has that key. I'm impressed. With it, he unlocked the door protecting the next floor. However, when he saw the windows, he slowed down, unable to accept it. Oh, it's useless. All the windows have been sealed. You cannot escape. The man didn't give up. Instead, he turned and ran to where Kate was. He arrived at the security room, slamming into the door behind Kate. The door is perfectly shut. You will not open it. Finally, the man seemed to give up. After a few seconds of silence, he stood back and fell defeatedly to the floor. Now you understand your position. When the alarm played, Asia were notified. They will be here in less than 10 minutes. Before that, there is something I want to tell you. Slowly, the man looked up, once again trying to determine where Kate's voice was coming from. It's not possible for me to unlock the exit. For that, Ashtia's input is needed. However, I know of a secret way out. When Kate said that, the man stood back up. Had his hearing failed him? In this building, there is a hidden door. I have also the hidden uh, I have also hidden the key you'll need to unlock it somewhere here. If you don't waste time, you can leave before Ashia comes. This alarm has never been activated before. I will tell them that a malfunction has set it off. If nobody's found when the building is unlocked, they will believe my word. If you want that, there are two conditions you must agree on. You've stolen from us countless times. It is undeniable that Sin must be a wealthy group. For your liberty, you will provide me with 50 million yen. I believe that is a fair sum. Secondly, you must reveal your identity in front of the cameras. I know you, Sin. I know a lot more than you think. Ido is the mole. I know where you gather, and I've investigated many of you. Just like I know you, you know me. For that reason, 
If anything were to happen to me, this recording and all the information I have will be immediately exposed. Do you agree to these conditions? The loud voice faded with static. Before the silence could grow uncomfortable, the man nodded. Then he slowly took off his mask. Okay, never mind. It's not the time Atsuki was in the tower. But brother? <laughs>